what is AI and what can it do for you? So as we mentioned, AI technology that mimics human intelligence and what it's pretty useful for is efficiency, automating things. And if we think of AI, a very simple way to think about it is that we have some data, normally big data, we have algorithms, we have analytics, then decision making, then automation. That's kind of the, the AI stack. Analytics, algorithms, and no, no, data, algorithms, analytics, decision making, and automation. And so that process is really good for making things more efficient. And as James mentioned in part of my introduction, the World Economic Forum predicts in the next two years that 85 million jobs will be removed from the global workforce because of the coming of artificial intelligence. And 92 million jobs will be created because of the coming of artificial intelligence. Now, is it the 85 million? Who are going to take the 92 million jobs? What do you think? Probably not. The 90% of the 85 million who will lose their jobs are the jobs of women, minorities, and youth because they are the entry-level jobs. They are the front service counters. They are the back in office. They are the administrative jobs in financial services. And indeed in financial services, we know that at least 40% of all jobs in this sector will be automated within the next three years. So how are we thinking about this and who is leading this? So in addition to efficiency being something that AI will be really good at, so I was an AI entrepreneur, uh, built a business out of New York. We built a subject matter expert brain out of machine learning called semi-supervised machine learning, and we sold this to banks so that they didn't need to rely on their humans to know all about their products. They could rely on the machine. Uh, the machine sometimes called Tron by some of the banks, didn't need to sleep, didn't get sick, didn't get paid, was always there and available. So I love the fact that Brett just comes out really boldly and says it as it is. Because a lot of AI community go, oh, it's all around augmentation. We're going to augment the humans. I actually agree with Brett. We are probably going to be replacing the humans with these machines. Now, the great thing that AI can do, in addition to efficiency, is analytics and helping you make better decisions. And so the way machine learning works is essentially you just fill the machine full of data and it does what we call sort of a, a self... Um, analyzing library and analysis that will come out with results or with answers that you didn't even know you needed to know. So this is the value of machine learning, that it can produce great brand new insights because it can analyze things in a different way to what humans can do and do it far more powerfully than humans. And we're thinking about the power of AI. When AI was invented back in 1956, compared to then to now, we have one trillion times more computing power today than we had back then. So this is how vast and how powerful this sector of artificial intelligence is. So, we know it's going to replace jobs. We know financial services will be under the spotlight. So we need to think about what we do. And we also need to think about, in Australia, how many more workers do we need in this sector to remain in any way able to play on the international stage? So the numbers at the moment are that Australia needs 1.2 million more high-tech people in our economy just to keep us at the level we are, which is, as I said, already a bit behind. We need 160,000 more data scientists, so this is by the end of the century, uh, century, end of the decade, so by 20, 
2030. We need 160,000 more data scientists by 2030 as well. Where are they going to come from is a really beautiful question. And how is the government thinking about artificial intelligence? Well, last year, the previous government announced it was going to put $124 million into building Australia's AI capability. Now, I am a chair of a venture capital fund, and I was with a, another VC friend of mine over the weekend who runs Westpac's venture capital arm, Simon Cant, his name is, and I said to Simon, hey, Si, what's your fund? How, how much money have you got in your fund now? He goes, oh, yeah, we've got $150 million is in our fund. And in Artesian Capital, which is the fund that uh, owns the Boab AI, AI Accelerator that I chair, they have $400 million in their fund. So that is individual venture capitalists, much more money than the entire government invests in, in Australia. And so this remains a concern. And, and why might this be the case? It is possibly because we've never had a burning platform like the US had. They had to innovate their way out of the global financial crisis and all the other crises that they have. We've actually been very lucky. We haven't had major disruption. We haven't really had the really severe impact back in 2008 that global financial crisis was. And we weren't really that impacted by the pandemic. In other countries, we've seen during the last 12 months in the pandemic, five years of technology acceleration compared to what we expected. And with that technology acceleration has come this powerful interest in artificial intelligence, but also the emergence of things such as Web3 and the metaverse, which I'm, I'm also going to um, talk to you about. So excuse me, I'm just recovering on the back, not, not COVID, just on, of a little cold. Um, so, question is, big moving, fast moving AI tech sector, who's leading it? Well, the government, maybe, as we said, not really. And how is it being regulated? So at the moment, there are no laws or rules that regulate artificial intelligence anywhere, really, in the world. The EU has the first draft legislation for artificial intelligence that is being considered and negotiated. There is no laws that govern. So me as an AI entrepreneur, in what my tech does or how it's deployed. There are certainly domain rules and regulations that if we're deploying AI, it would need to adhere to, but really there's not any laws or regulation. And that's because the technology is just way ahead of where government and the regulators are at. And so what are we going to do about that? And what may be the downside of AI? So in an unregulated world of technology, there's some very dark things that can happen. And I'll give you an example. So one of the great case studies of all time for fintech, gone badly with AI, is the Apple Card. Any of you remember this story? Goldman Sachs and the Apple Card? Okay, so this is about 12 months ago. So, Goldman Sachs and Apple got together. We'll do an automated AI-based credit card. That sounds like a cool idea. We'll go and get some data. We'll train some algorithms. We'll do some analytics. We'll automate it. It'll make some decisions, and then it'll allocate the credit to people who apply. So that went out very virally across social media and people starting to just put in their credit details to get their Apple Card credit. And a certain person who was the co-founder of Apple, Steve Wozniak, put in his credit details and his wife, Mrs. Wozniak, put in her credit details and they applied to get individual credit. So assuming in a fair and just world, Mr. Wozniak, Mrs. Wozniak would get the same amount of credit. They have the same financial details. But in fact, that didn't happen at all. What happened was Mrs. Wozniak got 10 times less 
credit than Mr. Wozniak. And overall, of all the millions of people that applied, women, on average, got 20 times less credit than the men did. So how does that happen? And how the heck does that happen with Goldman Sachs and Apple? These are not two small companies kind of fiddling around. These are two big-ass, well-known companies. Well, what happened with that? was the way they had built their AI was taking historical data sets which had already a very poor representation of women in there to train the algorithms, to do the analytics, to make the decision, to automate the credit decision. And so that story all starts with the big data they used was biased against women and no doubt minorities as well. So one of the big questions that we have is, what happens if we take these historical data sets and use them to train the algorithms, whether it's in financial services or human services or anything else, what happens then? Are we just hard coding the biases of history into the machines, as Brett said, at scale that will run the world and make decisions? Well, the answer to that is, yeah, that is actually probably what we're doing. And that is a real problem. We have another example with Amazon. So Amazon, again, big-ass technology company, think they'd know, was recruiting people into their business. So they took some historical da data, trained their algorithms, did some analytics, made some decisions about who would be recommended in to get a job in Amazon. Anyway, what happened? is that the historical data really reflected on the traditional hiring policy of actually it's all about men. So in the artificial intelligence field, nine in 10 people globally are males, only one in 10 are females. And in Amazon, which is a big AI company, essentially the AI learned that it should only recommend men in to be recruited. And if anyone had on their CV, that the AI was reading, that they went to women's college or played women's hockey or did anything that mentioned anything to do with the feminine, then they would be excluded from the recruitment process. So this again went viral, was terrible. Another example, Optum Health, big, big healthcare, international healthcare company, used historical data to train the algorithms to allocate specialist healthcare um, needs, the historical data discriminated against lower socioeconomic people and only referred additional healthcare and emergency healthcare to people from a higher socioeconomic, typically white background. Another company, Babylon, used historical data to train um, a wearable app to detect heart attack. And if you had wearing this um, device and you started to get shortness of breath, pain in your arm, and it would detect you were having a heart attack before you actually had that heart attack, it would alert emergency services, alert your doctor, and an ambulance would rush towards you. So that was okay if you were a male. But if you were a female, what it typically did would, me would measure it as a panic attack and not send medical help. So the world now is currently plagued with these real problems of bias, harm, and what we call unintended consequences of artificial intelligence. So what do we do about that? Question before, can the government lead this? Well, they try, and I work very closely with the ministers, both New South Wales and in federal government, uh, including good conversations with Minister Ed Husick now, very close relationship with Victor Dominello in New South Wales. Also the Human Rights Commission, the eSafety Commissioner, about how do we position Australia to be a responsible AI country, a nation of trusted technology? Because to be honest, we're not famous for anything else, really, in the tech field. So there is an opportunity for us to do something with responsible AI. 
So let's talk about what that is and why we want to do it. So responsible AI is a whole of business strategy of which ethical AI is one part. And responsible AI starts from the board, investors, executive team, governance, assessments, policies, procedures, and practices around deploying, designing and deploying AI in a manner that is consistent with strong ethical standards, with societal norms, with organisational values, and with regulation if it exists. And the ethical AI part of that has eight core principles, which I'll step you through. Now, these eight core principles are pretty much global, and Minister Karen Andrews, when she was the minister in the previous government, she, I worked on her task group to, to come up with these principles. So this is, these, these are what they are. And the way to think about this is, if you want to build a responsible AI strategy and business, here are the principles and the framework that you would use to do that. So the first one is, if you're building AI, designing it, deploying it, AI must be built with human society and the environment benefit in mind. It cannot come at a cost to any of those three groups. Number one principle. Number two principle. AI must be built with human-centered values at its core. Now, what is a human-centered value? And is the human-centered value of me the same as the human-centered value of you, the same as the human-centered value in Brazil or China and India? Big question, but that is the principle. Number three, AI must be fair. It must not discriminate, like the examples I've just given. The next principle, AI must be reliable and safe. Principle five, it must adhere to privacy and security requirements. Number six, it m must be transparent and explainable. So I'll bring Mrs. Wozniak back into the picture now. So Mrs. Wozniak is at home, she's pretty pissed, she's got 10 times less credit than Steve, and she goes, okay, this is not good enough, I am going to contest this decision of my 10 times less credit. And so the sixth principle of an ethical AI framework is contestability. So if you were a responsible AI company, you would have a process where Mrs. Wozniak could come and contest the decision that the AI made. And in all the examples that Brett gave of super fast, super smart, scalable fintech, then all of that will be pretty much enabled by in AI and machine learning. And if you were to be using this fintech, and with a responsible AI company, you would have a contestability strategy or process for your customers to come in and contest. So that is actually the seventh principle is contestability. The sixth principle, jumping back, is that once Mrs. Wozniak has come and contested that decision, you, as a responsible AI company, need to make it transparent and explainable. So that would be taking Mrs. Wozniak down to see the data scientists who got the data, who did the algorithms, who made the machine that gave this decision, and they would have to be transparent, which means they need to open the box of AI and show Mrs. Wozniak how the machine, the software, made the decision about her credit limit. Not only does she have to have a look at it, but they also need to explain it. So the sixth principle is transparent and explainable AI. Now we talk about AI being a black box because what actually happens in AI machine learning is the machines learn each time they do something and then they change and they adapt. And sometimes the original programmers then have no way of explaining what these smart machines are doing because they are able to learn on their own account. So we really encourage you to think about white box AI and what they call um, XAI, explainable AI. So Mrs. Wozniak comes in, 
she's allowed to contest it. We take it down, we show her what went on and explain how the algorithms made this decision. And then the last principle, the eighth principle, is accountability. So then, in this case, Goldman Sachs and Apple would need to be accountable to Mrs. Wozniak, but not only them, potentially the vendor of the software who sold it to Goldman Sachs and Apple would also need to be accountable and potentially some reparation, some making good of the fact that this AI made mistakes or discriminated in this case. So they are the eight principles of ethical AI which sit within a greater remit of responsible AI.